familiar faces and new faces here. And for those of you who don't know me, I am Angel Vijayan, and I'm Senior Technical Product Manager at AI and founder of Women in Autonomy. Um, thank you for coming here. And um, the main reason for Women in Autonomy was found was to create an open forum and community for women to come together in, in the automotive space and to uh, provide them a platform to network, to educate ourselves, to discover new new uh, path, and also also for our voices to be heard and represented at all levels. And it was interesting to see how this panel is coming into place and having the discussions we probably have not seen in this space before, especially, and that too coming from women who are working in this field is just, just so exciting and giving so much energy to be here and be part of all of you guys. And um, our main, uh, main motivation is also that with these regular events and meetups, we help empower women of today and drive the next generation of uh, leaders and so that we can actually move forward in automotive, make them make the move for all of us. For <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so starting over here, we have Candace Plankin, Lead Counsel for Regulatory Policy, Government Affairs at Cruz. We have Holly Gordon representing trucking, head of policy at Ike. And we have Santa Brusso, autonomous vehicle policy manager at AAA for Northern California, Nevada, and Utah. So welcome to all of you, and thanks so much for, uh, for doing this. So today we're going to focus on an area that often causes confusion in the media, the rules of the road. Uh, the regulatory environment governing autonomous vehicles. And I have to start by asking all of you forevermore to be really careful about what you call an autonomous vehicle. If I read one more article in the press that refers to Tesla autopilot as an autonomous vehicle. So please, please keep in mind that autonomous vehicles do not require a human. And if it requires a human, it's an assisted driving technology. So there are no cars on the road today that are autonomous vehicles, so many are being tested. Okay, who, excuse me. <laughs> Who's got the alarm? <laughs> um, but when you think about Tesla Autopilot or GM Super Cruise or other uh, technologies that are helping you drive, those are not autonomous. They're assisted driving technologies. If all of you can go forth in the world and help everyone understand that, I think that would be uh, a big step forward. <laughs> so um, today we're only going to talk about policy and regulation that affects autonomous vehicles. We're not gonna talk about assisted driving technology today. So <coughs> let's start by having uh, our panelists tell us a little bit about each of their companies so we can understand how they fit in the space. Candace, maybe you could start us off. Um, tell us about Cruise's autonomous vehicle program and the service that you're looking to offer. Sure, well thank you everyone for having me tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about Cruise. Cruise is working to build the most advanced autonomous vehicle technology to connect people to the places, the things, the experiences they care about. We were founded back in 2013, and we were the eighth company to receive an autonomous uh, testing permit in California. We built um, purpose-built cars with autonomous technology in Lake Orion, Michigan, and the beauty of that is that you have this deep integration between the software and the vehicles, and you also have critical redundancies. Our goal is to create a rideshare service um, starting in California, and you know, to date we've built um, traditional vehicles, but in the future we also envision bringing other types of vehicles to market for example, that might lack a traditional steering wheel or brake pedals. And so we have a vision for the future of transportation both here and throughout the country. Great. Holly, Ike is, de 
developing autonomous trucking technology. Can you tell us what I keep building and how it plans to operate? Sure, yes, yeah. so good evening everyone. Thank you for having, for having me here, it's um, great to be here tonight. So Ike is building trucking automation technology that will allow existing heavy duty trucks drive on our highways without a human driver. So that's basically a level four if you're familiar with the SAE levels. So we're looking to drive only on those federal highways. So how we'll implement that model is through a transfer hub. Um, and that means that the automated truck will exit the highway and immediately hand off to a manual tractor. And so there will be a truck driver who drives the remainder of that journey. And so to put it in context, the trucking industry is $700 billion industry in the U.S. About 70% of the freight in the U.S. is moved through trucks. And obviously that is not going to get any smaller or any easier over time. And so um, in 2017, 5,000 people were killed in trucking accidents. And so there are obviously a lot of pressures to find ways to make trucking more um, safe, more cost effective, more efficient, and we believe that trucking automation, especially on the highway piece, is a um, piece to that solution. Great, and Sansa, most people know AAA for roadside service or insurance or other products. Um, tell us how AAA has been involved in the shift towards autonomous vehicles. Yeah, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, AAA Northern California, Nevada, and Utah was founded over 100 years ago. Um, and as you probably know, it's, it's mostly known for our roadside service and the other uh, services that we offer. But really, it was started with a commitment to help the motoring public travel safely. And we're continuing with that mission when it comes to autonomous vehicles. Uh, we know that over 90% of the vehicle crashes that happen uh, can be attributed to, to human error. So we believe that autonomous vehicle technology really has the potential to save millions of lives. Um, but we really want to make sure that the technology is safe before it's deployed on public roads. So we've gotten into the AV space uh, with a couple of initiatives. Uh, the first one is really to support testing, and that's why we invested in the operation of GoMentum Station, which is uh, North America's largest secure test site, AV test site in, the, in North America. Uh, it's in Concord, California, about 30 miles from here, um, and it's uh, over, it has about 20 miles of roads, over 2,100 acres, uh, all sorts of features uh, where ABs can be tested safely uh, before they are put onto public roads and, and interacting with the general public. Um, we also conduct third-party testing with a just testing program that we're developing that can be run at Gomentum or in other places um, uh, to support AB testing. Uh, and then finally, we work on consumer education and policy advocacy. So one of the things that we've done, uh, for example, is we piloted a, a self-driving shuttle in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it was the first uh, sh uh, self-driving shuttle to operate that was open to the public and that operated in live traffic. And we uh, were able to give rides to over 32,000 people over the course of about 11 months, and uh, educating people about the a AV technology, we think, is also an important part to helping people understand what the benefits, but also the limitations of the technology are. Great. <coughs> well, let's get started uh, on regulation. We often hear that there's no federal regulation of autonomous vehicles, and instead we have the dreaded patchwork of state law. Um, Candace, how does it work with federal and state regulators? Uh, when are states allowed to make these rules? How should we be thinking about that interplay? So, it's an interesting topic what the interplay between the federal and the state government um, is. So at the federal level, the way I think about it is the federal government has the ability to regulate the vehicle itself. So the construction, the performance of the vehicle. Um, and as a result of that, the federal government has the federal motor safety standards that regulate everything from the placement of the steering wheel to the brake pedals. and. In that way, you know, anything that the federal government exclusively governs, you know, the states don't have the ability to do so. So you can't, for example, see the DMV um, make a regulation stating, well, now we're not going to have steering wheels in cars. That's done at the federal level. <coughs> in contrast, at the state level, you'll traditionally see states regulating um, rules of the road, driver licensing, insurance, uh, tort liability. The gray area in this space is 
that there isn't um, an FMVSS equivalent with respect to the autonomous driving system. So in that situation, you know, the safety of the brain, for example, that's something that we hope to see at the federal level because we don't want to see a patchwork of different regulations between the various states. But because the federal government hasn't acted yet to enact such a set of regulations, it's possible the states could also enter that field and they're not preempted. Um, so that's, that's essentially why people will say there, there isn't a set of federal standards regulating autonomous systems yet, but keep in mind, like the federal motor safety standards do exist and they place a lot of constraints on how you actually build such a vehicle. So one thing that I think people sometimes don't understand is, um, you know, the federal government has done some work in this area. That extra step that you're talking about, the federal motor vehicle safety standard is what we call formal regulation and it, it's actually that actual formal step of going through this Administrative Procedures Act and all these complicated rules that, that actually preempts. I think a lot of people thought, well, if NHTSA is out there talking about something or giving some, something less formal, that that would actually preempt states. But it's interesting that it really comes down to whether there's an actual Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard on the topic. Um, it seems like um, another way that we could get preemption is through uh, congressional action, right? Do we see that? I, I, I think there was some discussion of that in some recent bills, but is it, is it true that Congress could do that on its own? Yeah, and I mean, I think you see, you know, at the federal level, um, there was an effort, you know, with the AB Start Act, the, the issue was that there weren't sufficient votes um, in the Senate, but, you could see through um, congressional like legislation, that would be another way to potentially preempt the states. Um, so, you know, NHTSA could either issue regulations, right? NHTSA has the ability also to alter the standards they already have with respect to FMVSS, or you could see Congress acting. I think that the likelihood of us seeing an AB bill pass this session is probably not high at this time, but we hope. You know, to see that, that would be ideal. Um, but there are different ways the federal government could preempt the states from acting in that space. Yeah. So you mentioned that the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards govern a lot of aspects of vehicles, uh, including things like steering wheels and manual controls. Um, I know that Cruz has actually applied for an exemption to offer a car that would uh, not comply with those rules. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Yeah, so, you know, the interesting thing is once you remove the human driver from the vehicle, you know, the ADS is truly driving, and so there isn't a need for, for example, the steering wheel or the brake pedal or even the rear view mirrors any longer. In fact, you know, there is a concern that at the point where the human driver there's no expectation that they should intervene and you don't want them to interfere with the driving of the system. If you, for example, have that steering wheel still in the vehicle, that could create a greater safety hazard. So we are developing a vehicle of the future that wouldn't have these types of manual controls and we filed a petition with NHTSA. It's called a Part 555 petition um, back in January 2018 in order to get an exemption from those requirements. The tricky thing is that when you file that type of exemption, it's limited. So it's only, I believe, 2,500 vehicles, it's only two years, and you don't have control over whether the petition is ultimately approved and on what timeline. So in our case, um, NHTSA has taken comments, but they still haven't issued a decision on that petition. So given all of that, ideally, um, you know, ideally we will get those exemptions, but the other scenario is NHTSA decides to actually alter the FMVSS to allow for new standards in the case of autonomous vehicles. The challenge there is government doesn't tend to act quickly, so it'll probably be on a longer timeline. So those are the types of um, challenges that manufacturers in this space face when they try to create new next um, iterations of vehicles. 
So we've all seen those great pictures of autonomous vehicles of the future, you know, and there's four people and they're playing checkers, you know, and everybody's, you know, seated facing the wrong way and all that. And apparently they didn't realize how much regulation is involved to actually get to that, to get to that new configuration. Um, Samantha, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the federal government has done so far and what uh, AAA has been thinking about that in terms of, um, you know, should the government at the federal level act more quickly? Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, what they've done so far? Yeah, sure. Uh, what the US DOT uh, has done thus far has been to issue three different sets of guidance on uh, autonomous vehicles and these uh, guidance documents are are they're non prescriptive and they're entirely voluntary um, they encourage things for example such like the automakers to um, submit these voluntary safety uh, self-assessments but they don't require them to um, and they also outline different uh, uh, best practices um, I think the most recent one also featured uh, especially focus on commercial vehicles uh, and best practices for commercial vehicles and for um, states as well to issue um, their own uh, regulations that would support the, the permitting process. So again, you know, what they've done is, is they've got these guidelines, um, but what AAA has said is, is that uh, the, the government or the DOT really should move forward uh, to establish uh, regulations for uh, AVs in the form of Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards and provide provide guidance uh, in, in, through that process. Um, though we recognize that it would take a long time either way through either through the exemption process, which could be uh, streamlined, and, I, and we know that NHTSA has been looking into that as well. Um, so, but it's gonna, yeah, either way through the exemption process or through the development of Federal Motor Vehicle uh, Safety Standards. Uh, it would still take a, a number of years, and I think that's where you know, the role of the state comes in in terms of uh, permitting um, and looking at what is uh, what, what should be part of the permitting process, so that they know um, what is being tested, what is what is potentially being deployed uh, on on their on their state's roads. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when you say, well, it could they could act through changing the exemption process. In some ways, that's sort of allowing smaller changes uh, in, on a test basis. Let's see how it works for a smaller uh, number of vehicles, and then you know, before we put an actual regulation in place, it's kind of, I think that would operate as some sort of a, a test if you allowed it in smaller batches. Um, but I think the, the point of time between allowing exemptions or doing a regulation is probably similar given how long it's taken still waiting over there for your <laughs> your exemption so it's, it's hard to tell yeah I mean I should I should have noted one thing that I failed to say is that NHTSA still does have recall authority at the federal level so in the event that NHTSA feels that there's a safety defect with a vehicle they have the ability to act there isn't like a void at the federal level with respect to enforcement so Although they're still in the process of developing regulations, they still have that hammer <laughs> in the event that there's a bad actor. And that's something to also keep in mind. And I think that because there's such a value in uniformity of regulations over patchwork, that you know that, that authority in this uh, to recall is something we should keep in mind and I would be more deferential towards the federal level of government in developing these regulations. So, in terms of the process to go ahead and develop uh, federal motor vehicle safety standards, um, NHTSA has issued some notices of rulemaking. There's this complicated series of steps where in order to regulate an industry, the government has to provide notice, accept comment, have a lot of deliberation, hearing, and when people say, oh, it takes so long, to pass regulate, you know, to put regulations in. It's not because somebody's sitting there typing it up, it's because of all the layers of process that are built in by federal law uh, to that process. Um, how has NHTSA gone about taking these first steps? I know there've been some notices of rulemaking. Um, what are you guys seeing in terms of how NHTSA is approaching it in terms of coming up with these rules? 
Yeah, well, NHTSA has certainly been pretty active in terms of uh, a couple of different um, uh, processes, right? They had their request for comment, I think, in 20, late 2017, 2018, uh, regarding F MVSS that may pose a barrier to the design, testing, and deployment of AVs. And then they issued the uh, Advanced Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or ANTRIM, on how to amend the F FMB of that FMVSS <laughs> to permit uh, non-traditional designs. Um, they also had an ANTRIM on the ADS demonstration program that we that we commented on, and that was about what if there were going to be a, a pilot program to test some of these vehicles and in, in, in different use cases. What should that program look like? Um, so there hasn't been any shortage of activity, but I think from um, like from a technology perspective, you know, the technology is, is advancing faster than the regulation, uh, and uh, although they, they have certainly been been putting these uh, anthems out and, and, seeking, and getting comment, and, and the comments have certainly been voluminous and, and well documented, uh, that it's not it's not really keeping pace. You know, the, the decision making at the at the federal level is not keeping pace with how the technology and the deployment is, is happening. Yeah, it's. Um, it, it's definitely a long process and um, you know I think we're to sum up where we are on the federal side we've got these voluntary guidance people are uh, issuing companies are putting out their safety assessments all on a voluntary basis um, and step by step this is trying to start down the road toward regulation but it, it's really hard to say how long that's going to take one thing that could um, put some time parameters around that would be if Congress acted. We mentioned earlier that there have been some, some bills in Congress they didn't pass. Um, what are some of the things that, that Congress was looking to do? Is it really just about kind of sticking it to NHTSA, like, okay, guys, this is it. You gotta, you gotta act now, or do you, how, how do you feel that Congress would really change the picture? Trucking, so I don't <laughs> 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 well, I hope we won't talk about trucking in a minute. We'll get to trucking. I, mean, I don't. I don't think they're trying to stick it to this. Um, yeah. I, I, I think that there is an, an incredible interest in this field, and legislation would have done many things. One of which was increasing the number of exemptions that are possible, so it would have allowed for development of some of these alternative vehicles until NHTSA actually adopted final regulations. And so I think in certain ways it would have opened up more space for the companies um, to develop their vehicles during this kind of purgatory phase. <laughs> you know? um, and so I think there was a lot of merit to it, but you have a lot of stakeholders in those negotiations uh, with varied interests, you know, everyone from insurance to the trial attorneys to, you know, so I think the that, yeah. Yeah, there's just many <laughs> different groups, um, and so it's, it's, it was difficult to reach a consensus, um, but hopefully it will come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there were a couple of issues that that um, held up the bill from, from passage, which merited further consideration, including cybersecurity was one of the issues that had been mentioned, uh, and also the, the issue of, of preemption of state authority, and that language uh, was, was felt to be unclear in terms of how much it preempted states from acting with regard to uh, AVs and, and, um, and what elements of, of AVs would be regulated by the state versus by the um, federal government. So I think getting the language right on that and getting mm -hmm. the um, cybersecurity provisions um, to a point where, where more of the um, of the regulators felt, uh, legislators felt, felt comfortable with that is, is in process. Um, and I could note also that, that Congress is again considering federal legislation to regulate um, AVs and they had, they submitted a request for feedback on ADS legislation just this August, so not so long ago. Um, and we submitted a letter, AAA submitted a letter um, in response to that and we noted a couple things. Uh, one that it should mandate that, um, federal legislation should mandate that the VSSAs be issued before an ABS developer tests on public roads. Um, and we also opined on um, testing 
and about how testing results should be made available uh, so that they can be reviewed and that there be a feedback process so that stakeholders can have uh, the opportunity to address concerns that arise from, from the test data. So there's a lot of politics uh, involved probably in all of that. Um, certainly, as you say, there's so many different stakeholders that it, it's, um, it's hard to see there being a lot of progress um, anytime, anytime soon on that. Um, Holly, trucking is the, the lucky winner of the regulatory lottery. You guys get even more regulation. You, you have a whole separate agency uh, that you also have to consider in addition to the NHTSA uh, rules that, that would also govern your vehicles. Um, tell us about the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration and uh, what that regulation looks like. Sure, I think one thing I would add um, regarding the legislation, um, the AV Star Bill and the Self Drive um, Act, which are the House and Senate versions of the bill, did not include trucking. Um, and that was actually not something I worked on very much. But my understanding is that a big piece of what happened with that bill was the um, trial lawyers getting involved. So all the pieces of Xantha and Candace talked about are obviously really important from a technical perspective and a substance perspective, but really what came down to in that bill was the trial lawyers getting involved um, and wanting different types of litigation versus arbitration, and I, I think that's actually what scuttled the bill in the end. So we'll see if they can make any progress on that um, this next time around, but I tend to agree with Candace. I think it's a you know, single digit percent chance that that will happen, but we can hope. Um, but that bill, um, as I mentioned earlier, does not include trucking, it actually just includes cars. So, so why don't we take a step back a little bit, because I saw a few confused faces out there, um, just in terms of how the regulatory structure is set up. So you have the Department of Transportation, um, Elaine Chow is the Secretary of Transportation, Mitch McConnell's wife, for those who are playing along with the little name. Um, and so she, you know, Department of Transportation is sort of sits at the top for all of us here at the table. And then beneath that, you have NHTSA, which can has been said repeatedly for those who aren't familiar with NHTSA, that's the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. And so that, as Candace mentioned, regulates the vehicle. Um, and then you also have FMCSA, um, which is the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Um, I'm sorry, Federal Motor Carrier, and it, so it, it regulates commercial vehicles. So under DOT, you have NHTSA, which regulates a whole bunch of things, including the vehicle. Um, including the equipment of our trucks. So can, should we have a steering wheel in our truck? Should we have mirrors and things like that? And then FMCSA regulates the operation of that vehicle. So how do they inspect the vehicle? You know, does it get pulled over? You know, how, how the vehicle performs, basically. And so Michelle is correct in the sense that we are regulated by both NHTSA and FMCSA. However, we've been, as a company and a, as an automated trucking industry, much more focused on the FMCSA side and that's for a couple of reasons. That's because NHTSA, again, represents the equipment. Um, speaking for Ike and probably most of the companies out there in the automated trucking space, we're not looking to change that equipment. We're not looking to remove the steering wheel or remove the mirrors in the same way that the, ca the cars are, and there's lots of reasons for that. It makes, they're dealing with limited space, they have to have passengers inside there. We're not looking, there's no humans in our trucks. Um, and so we don't need to make those changes, and so we're not really paying you know, super careful attention to NHTSA right now. That's not to say that it won't be important for us in the future, but it's not heavily on our minds right now. What is on our minds is the FMCSA. And so, as Xantha and Candace mentioned, there was guidance that was issued, which is called AB 3.0 or Autonomous Vehicle 3.0. There was also AB 2.0. Um, and those are guidance documents that were issued by the Department of Transportation. We were all, or I can speak for the trucking space, we were very encouraged by what was in those guidance documents. They're very helpful for the industry. It's a very sort of hands-off type of thing. They want us to move forward, but those are just guidance documents. They're actually not a very strong form um, from a legal perspective. And so beneath that, you have NHTSA and FMCSA again. They issued what's called an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, um, or AMP, I've never heard that before, AMP, friend, yeah. which is, I don't know if Santa was saying, um, it's probably great to um, have an acronym for that because it's a mouthful. And so that's, as it sounds, advanced notice. That's, we're thinking about writing a rule, we're thinking about it, can you give us some input? And they really did um, stick with what was in the AB 3.0 guidance. They came across pretty much repeatedly saying you know, the same things that they said in the guidance, but now it's an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. All the companies, all people in the public, can you please comment on these things? And there was one at the NHTSA side and one at FMCSA. So Cruz commented, I 
question on the NHTSA side, and we commented on the FMCSA side. And they did look quite different. I didn't spend a lot of time on the NHTSA one, so Sam can speak more to that, but I spent a lot of time on the FMCSA side. And really what that's looking at is, okay, we have these rules in place. They've been regulating trucks for a really long time. What happens when there's no human? Right? And this is obviously something they didn't think about when they wrote these rules. They weren't necessarily trying to exclude automated trucks. They just hadn't thought about it. They didn't exist. And so some things you can put aside really easily, like rules about texting while driving or licensing or um, you know things where you, you have to regulate the human. Those things you can put aside and say the automation system doesn't have to comply with that, at least we hope. And that's really what's been said in the guidance and what's been said in the AMPRM. And so now the things that we're very focused on are the things that are a little trickier, right? So what happens when they want to inspect the vehicle on the side of the road? There's no human in the vehicle, right? So the truck is driving along, a level four truck is driving along, it needs to move to the side of the road and be inspected. There's no one for them to interact with. Or what happens when a first responder, like an ambulance or a fire truck drives by? How does that truck move over for that? Or how does it get pulled over if it's speeding, which it probably be and hopefully won't be. <laughs> very legitimate questions and they're not easy questions and we recognize that there needs to be answers to those questions and frankly for most of us including IFL product roadmap is pretty far along but it's not at those points and so some of the questions in the AMPRM we were able to give helpful answers to and the others we just said we're very open to collaborating with you we will work with you in the future we want to make sure these things can happen we recognize these things are important and what I believe will happen is the ANPRM will then move to a proposed rule. Now whether or that, not that will happen before we have an election next November is anyone's guess. I do not have a crystal ball, I have no idea. I think it's possible that a proposed rule will get issued before the election, but then you have a comment period. And then they may have another comment period. They can do as many comment periods as they want on the proposed rule. And then they would have to issue a final rule. Um, well, they don't have to, frankly. Actually, it's up to them if they want to, but we, we would like for them to do that. Um, and so the final rules would be a much more sort of stable piece of legal document than a guidance document or certainly an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. It's not as stable as a piece of legislation, which is the other thing that Candace and Sam have been talking about, which is the AB Star Bill and the Self-Drive Act. Um, those are at the congressional level. The House and Senate are fighting over that. Um, they have excluded up until this point have excluded trucking, um, mostly because of labor unions and other things. So we don't see that as enormously problematic. It would be nice to be included, but at this point, we um, just want the rulemaking process to move forward so that we don't reach a point when we get to that stage in our product development that we need to go through the same exemption process that Cruz and Neuro and others are going through right now. Because while the exemption process should, in theory, be faster because it's individual companies, that's only an individual company pressuring the regulatory agency to make things move forward. If you're doing a rulemaking, at least you have you know the whole group of us saying like, please move this forward. And so that's that's kind of how we see things um, right now. And the election could really change things because remember, if we do get a Democrat, um, and um, that would mean that Elaine Chow is no longer at the DOT, and that trickles down to FMCSA and NHTSA, and everything could change. So it just it's you know remains. So um, you have this whole set of issues that you've just described, um, but just to be clear, in order for autonomous trucking to be authorized at the federal level, you would need Congress or NHTSA the same way that the autonomous cars do in terms of a federal rule um, authorizing that layer of autonomous technology. Otherwise, you're looking at state regulation, right? Well, I mean, I think there's going to be state regulation either way, because I don't, I don't think a federal rule, I mean, I could be wrong here, but I don't think an FMCSA rule is going to, and actually couldn't preempt state legislation. And so I, I do think that will be a parallel path in those things for quite some time. That's right. I meant the NHTSA rules that we were talking about. That you, in, in other words, trucks are going to be governed state by state for the autonomous layer of technology by NHTSA. If they, if they do it, it either NHTSA is going to issue a federal rule or you're going to be in the state patchwork of regulations, right? So I'm just trying to be clear that trucking, um, because you are also subject to the NHTSA Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, it would also be helpful for you to have a federal 
standard um, for tracking you know, that apply, would apply to you as well? It would be, but what I was saying earlier is that we're not making changes to our trucks in the way that crews and others are making changes to their cars. So we don't need, we don't probably don't need NHTSA to act because we're not taking our steering wheel out. We're not rearranging the inside of the truck the way that the car companies are for the very reasons that I was explaining earlier is that we're not TNCs, we're not driving passengers around. And so we are, the, you know, People have seen what the new wave trucks look like, especially when they become electric, and I can imagine years down the road that we will need um, um, NHTSA to act on the trucking side of equipment, but right now, that's, that's not our highest priority. It's not necessary for NHTSA to act for us to get our level four trucks on the road. That's right, but with respect to the, the brains of the truck, the autonomous technology, for the same reason that Candace is saying that she doesn't have a federal rule that would preempt states from like California from regulating the autonomous technology. Similarly, trucks are looking, you know, are governed by state rules at this point in, until there's some federal motor vehicle safety standard on the autonomous technology, which it doesn't exist today. Sure. Right. So it, it, it would be helpful for trucking to have a single national standard versus. Sure, but I just don't think a, a, a NHTSA rule that involve trucking would um, preempt state legislation to support our business. I guess that's what I'm saying. Okay. Um, so let's, let's talk about the preempt, the state regulation. Um, you know, because we don't have the federal motor vehicle safety standards in place for the autonomous technology layer, states have not been preempted. We've seen a variety of uh, state laws. Um, maybe Candace, you could start us off from the industry perspective. What does it mean to have potentially 48 states each having different rules governing uh, whether autonomous vehicles can be tested, whether they can be deployed, uh, what kind of permits are required? Um, it's not great. <laughs> um, you know, you can see, like, uh, if you look at the transportation network companies, and when I say that I'm referring to Uber and Lyft, they have a lot of different state regulations that they have to comply with. It becomes very complicated once you launch throughout the country. And the same would apply to autonomous vehicles. So I, I don't think it's good for the industry to have a lot of variation and experimentation across the country. Some might disagree, you know, some might, regulators might think it, you know, it should be very local. But I think if you really want to scale a business and if you want to build a system that you can export to multiple locations, it's far better to have uniformity. Um, luckily, there's uniformity with respect to the structure of the car, but I also think you want to see uniformity with respect to the sta any standard set for the ADS, the automated driving system. So um, that's something that I, I emphasize a lot with regulators, just the fact that regulatory certainty and uniformity in regulations is really something that is very much needed by the industry. We don't want to see that much work. How, how uh, do you think companies will respond if in fact there's no federal rule and you're just, you know, you want to launch in California, you have to follow California's rules and you want to launch in Florida, uh, maybe there are no rules or, you know, the, it, how, how would you handle that? Would you feel as a company that it's going to default to the strictest state, like, okay, California has a lot more requirements, or maybe they have a particular type of uh, black box reporter that they want, so you know what, let's just, let's just do that everywhere and operate our business in, or in accordance with the strictest state, or do you think um, companies will kind of go to each state and, and modify their operations separately? The answer would be it depends. Um, I think that in certain instances, it's easier to just follow the most strict rule for all jurisdictions, but to the extent you can modify it, it is a huge operational burden. It could make sense to do so. Also, sometimes you'll see, I, I don't have a great example off the top of my head, but sometimes local regulations can also be in conflict, in, in which case you can't you know, comply with every single state without modifying um, your product somewhat. So I think that, you know, right now, luckily I don't see a conflict between the legislation that's been passed in different jurisdictions. I track it and I am, um, you know, given where we are today, 
we could go to NHTSA, for example, present our safety case, roll out in different jurisdictions, and the variation isn't so extreme that it would be difficult. Um, but you know, if we did see more variation, I think that we would obviously have to be compliant. But you know, a good example. This is actually probably the best example of it. Most jurisdictions say that you have to attest that your system is capable of complying with the local uh, traffic laws and regulation. And we all know that that is not consistent across various jurisdictions. So that in and of itself requires some type of modification depending on the state. And so we have to deal with that today. Um, it's not ideal. It'd be great if there was one <laughs> set of traffic <laughs> rules across the country. and. You know, it's something that in the ideal world we would have. I don't think that we're going to see that anytime soon. Um, but that's why you're kind of forced into a situation where you have to modify it somewhat for that regulation at least. Mm -hmm. um, Santa, do you have a different view on, on the benefits of kind of federal regulation versus letting states regulate one by one? Or how, how do you see um, the different states uh, regulations that have been passed. Yeah, um, ultimately there, there should be harmonization uh, between the different levels of government and different jurisdictions so that there's uh, some more regulatory certainty and clarity for the, uh, the companies um, that are developing this technology and deploying this technology. Um, but given that we've also seen uh, it, that it's gonna take a while for uh, federal standards to get developed, um, you know, states do have the ability to take approaches to regulating the testing and, and the deployment of vehicles within within their states. So we've been working with different state um, regulators to uh, look at their at their testing and deployment permit process, which is something that they have the authority uh, over. And really, in terms of the numbers, I think there's 29 states and DC that have legislation related to AVs, but um, a, some of these are really more enabling um, pieces of legislation, not specifically on uh, the, the actual operation or, or design or manufacture of the vehicles. Um, and so some of them are really about uh, just creating committees, for example, uh, to study AVs. And it's really only in a few states where they have more specific uh, requirements for permitting uh, and registration of, of the vehicles. Um, and, and what we've seen is that um, they're really requiring things like self-certification or self-attestation by the companies to say that they can operate within the uh, operational design domain they want to deploy in or test in in, in those states. So uh, when you look at it, you know, when you look at say California's, which a lot of uh, folks have argued is, is say, the, the strictest state, um, but what, what they have there is really a process that's just very similar to the self-certification process that um, is already in use by uh, all the OEMs in, in America. Um, and they have a couple additional requirements with regard to insurance um, and uh, logging data and interacting with, with, um, with um, law enforcement. But, but ultimately, uh, it's not I wouldn't say that it, that it, it compares um, to, say, uh, some standards in, in other countries like Europe or China, which have more performance-based standards uh, and which have um, requirements that, that vehicles be tested on, um, on, uh, on closed tracks and, and perform according to do certain scenarios and, and, and meet certain standards. So it's a very different um, uh, set of, of requirements level uh, in the U.S. compared to other places. I mean, I, um, I hear that perspective. I, I do think, though, that, you know, self-certification is a norm in the United States. It's not such a deviation from what has been done for years here. And I think there are certain challenges with adopting models that are just scenario-based testing models. Um, you could teach a vehicle to the test. It doesn't necessarily prove um, anything more, I think, than basically the self-certification. And and I also wouldn't take for granted what we are required to certify. So 
in the case of California, you have to certify in order to get a driverless test permit that you are a level four, level five vehicle, which is a very high bar um, with respect to saying that there is no intervention from a human driver. And there are penalties in the event you make it out of station and you're no knowingly um, making a false statement. So I, I would say that we shouldn't underestimate what does exist right now and the safety uh, standards that are set. Even though there are there is a need for more regulation in the future, the self-certification model has historically been used in this country and you know there is precedent for that. Holly, if you wanted to test autonomous trucks in different states, um, how do you feel those laws uh, compare? Um, are there plenty of states that are opening their arms and saying yes, come come test autonomous trucks on our roads, or are there more specific uh, requirements? Yeah, I mean, so it, it's a little bit different for trucking companies because uh, for Ike initially we will launch in one state in one freight lane. Um, so you know, different from crews who will probably be launching in multiple cities at once or testing in multiple places, we will not. We will launch in one state in one freight lane. Um, and not surprisingly, somewhere in the southern half of the country where it does not snow. Um, so we're not looking at 48 states or even 20 states right now. So I think that that you know, can narrow it down quite a bit. Um, so certainly while we would like to have uniformity at the federal level, it isn't super problematic for us right here, right now, the way the rules are written. Um, and so if you look at, you know, eventually we will launch, more, launch in more freight lanes and then more states and, and we will grow the business certainly um, throughout the U.S., but just to get us started, um, you know, one thing I do want to mention, and I, I say this almost every time I speak, is that this is going to take longer than people think. It's really, what we're doing is very difficult. It's technically difficult, um, and we want to get it right. Um, it's, you know, we're putting an 80,000 pound vehicle on the road, um, and so we want to make sure that we get it right. And so this is going to take a while, um, and so we're, you know, we're, we're willing to, ha happy to, and willing to collaborate and work with the regulators to get these um, things in place as we're building, as our engineering team is diligently working to build out our product. Um, and so what I would say is right now, you do have a little bit of a patchwork, but we're only looking at, you know, a very small portion of states. And so, for example, in California, if we had a level four truck tomorrow, we couldn't launch tomorrow. And, and again, I just not have a level four truck that they could launch tomorrow, so <laughs> that's not a problem. Um, but we will eventually, and I believe those rules will be in place eventually. So right now, California is an unusual case. Um, they've sort of, the Department of Motor Vehicles, which is sort of the equivalent to NHTSA and FMCSA at the federal level, um, is the regulatory agency at the state level here in California. And what they have done is they've put it into three different buckets. So it's cars, like crews, um, light trucks, which is an incredibly misleading name because it's um, delivery bots, like for those who are familiar with Neuro. Um, it's, you know, grocery bots that are traveling on the roadways. Those are light trucks and then you have heavy trucks. So there are rules for self-driving cars and those took many years to put in place working with the DMV. I did not work on those, but I, I know folks who did, and it took a long time. And so that, that's the testing program that Candace is talking about. And they have three different types of permits. I think it's like a self-drive permit, a driverless permit, a deployment permit. They all kind of blend together. From my perspective, it's a little confusing, um, but I don't work on cars. And so that has three, there's three different permits in California for cars. Like trucks, they put out draft rules. So Neural right now, for example, cannot operate in California. They are waiting for those rules to be issued. As soon as those rules were issued, I imagine that those types of light trucks or um, delivery bots were operating in California. The heavy truck rules have not even been issued as a draft rule yet in California. Um, they're doing them sort of think sequentially. Um, we do anticipate that the light truck rules will be issued sometime before the end of the year, or at least we hope so, and that they will issue some kind of draft rule for heavy trucks in California sometime next year. Um, and then we will continue to work with DMV and to get those rules right, and then we will, um, and that's just for the level four truck. We can test our trucks in California at a level two level. We just can't put a driverless truck on the highway in California right now, which is frankly fine because no one's doing that. Um, and so then if you look at other states, there's, you know, Texas, for example, is sort of the polar opposite of California. They passed legislation in 2017, so it's not a regulatory body. It's led the Texas legislature passed legislation that allows driverless cars, driverless trucks, um, with some restrictions, of course, and parameters, but we could operate in Texas tomorrow if we had a driverless truck that we wanted to operate. And then in some other states, it's just silent, so we, we may or may not be able to operate. Um, and there are some places where they talk about Thomas vehicles and they don't mention the word commercial, so it's, you know, 
somewhat not clear if we could operate there or not, depending on the piece of legislation. And so that's um, that's kind of how we're looking at the state rules right now. That's it. You know, I would different from what Michelle said. I don't actually think that the technology, at least for trucking, and is significantly far ahead of where the rules are. Um, I think the technology, as I said earlier, has a while to go, and that the regulations are being developed um, somewhat in parallel. We don't want them to go too slowly, but um, we see them being developed in parallel. And so the way we think about interacting with the state bodies is first and foremost, when we go to a new state, we tell the regulators, we call the Department of Transportation or the DMV, and we say, hi, we're operating in your state. Just wanted to let you know, here's our VIN numbers, you may see our trucks driving around. They are all driving in manual mode, and when we get to the safety piece, I'll, I'll talk about why that is, but we give them a heads up. And then we're also, on the, the legislative side, we're paying attention to what's happening at the legislature. And so there, like I said, there's a Texas bill that's passed, there's bills in a bunch of states that have passed. Um, lucky for Candace's cruise team, there are way more car bills than there are truck <laughs> bills for them to track. That's why their team is a lot bigger. Um, and so, you know, right now in October, the way we think about it is almost every legislation at the session is out, except for the federal one that comes back. But all the state sessions are over for the year. And so we have this lull right now where we're getting ready for 2020, and we'll think about, um, for us, it's, it's honestly primarily defense. You know, there's already rumors that there's a bill in Missouri that would prohibit autonomous trucks from operating in the state of Missouri. And so we're, you know, starting to pay attention to those right now and thinking about what next year will look like. Um, and the odd thing about state legislators, legis legislatures, is that some of them don't operate every year. So, like, believe it or not, Texas, <laughs> one of the largest states in the country, only meets in the odd years. There's no Texas legislative session next year. There's no Nevada legislative session next year. So there are a number of states that don't meet next year. So that, frankly, in some ways, makes our jobs easier unless we needed to change something in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have to plan for that. If you wanted something to happen in Texas, you needed to do it this year, otherwise you have to wait until 2021. Um, and so that's something that we're thinking about right now as we're planning for 2020. Great, that's very helpful. Um, so um, there's a, one more layer of state law that Candace mentioned, which is for ride services like Uber or Lyft. Um, and this is the subject of so much of the controversy that um, Uber incur you know, incurred in the early days of you know, how should ride services be regulated? And to the extent autonomous uh, vehicles come into play, most people believe they'll be in, in ride service contacts rather than being sold to the public and Cruise is considering op opening and offering a ride service. Um, how do you think about um, the special rules that, that govern ride services. I know in some states they're governed at the state level, sometimes it's city by city with the taxi commission. Um, how do you guys approach that? Well, I, I track the TNC laws as well, and it depends on the jurisdiction. So a good example, Florida, it's very explicit that AV companies that have a ride share service will have to comply with the TMC laws. So it's a given there, I know that those laws will apply to our service if we launch there, and so it's very clear to me um, what the compliance obligations will be. It's interesting, if you look at California, the laws that apply to Lyft and Uber actually don't apply to autonomous vehicles. Um, it's a slightly different set of rules. Um, our regulator, is the California Public Utilities Commission, CPUC, and they created these TNC laws for Uber and Lyft um, years ago. They're actually applying what's known as a charter party carrier framework to autonomous vehicles right now, and we actually had a workshop just this past Tuesday where they were debating what should the regulatory framework be for these vehicles. Should the same regulations that apply to TNCs apply? to um, AVs going forward. So it's not necessarily a given that the TNC framework will apply to AVs in the California market. So I'd say 99% of the time, I assume that the TNC regulations are gonna be controlling as I you know, track them, but it is possible that we'll see slightly different frameworks in a few locations. And in California, is that distinction that you're mentioning because it's anticipated that with autonomous vehicle fleets that the company would actually own the car? And I think 
kind of the exception when they created transportation network companies as a separate category um, to kind of make them different from taxis and other things. The idea was like, look, we don't even own these vehicles. This is just a bunch of people, a bunch of got pe drivers. They've got their own vehicles. This is not our fleet. And so now with an autonomous vehicle fleet, suddenly it is your fleet, right? Yeah, I think that's why they did it in the California market because, and that's not true of every state, in California, the distinction that was drawn was definitely the fact that you have this per personal ownership model instead of fleets. So they would say that we are more similar to, say, the limos, which fall under the TCP regulations as opposed to the Lyfts and the Ubers. In other states, transportation network company laws are different. They aren't necessarily always tied to personal vehicle ownership. So it's really like a state-by-state state analysis um, to look at how they classify TNCs. But you're totally right about the original distinction that was drawn in the California market and why they are using a different set of regulations for AVs. So you need a third category, I think, is well, what you <laughs> No, actually, I, I don't think you do. <laughs> I, uh, address consumer safety, they address data reporting. Um, so I actually would encourage the commission to stick with the TCP regulations rather than creating a whole new category because it really is like recreating the wheel each time. Um, and I think it also creates more of a level playing field if you don't have all these different transportation providers adhering to different standards. So that would be my response to the notion of a third category. Yeah, it, that's been debated at the CPUC, so I thought I would ask. Um, and then, um, what is the state of play at the CPUC if crews had level four vehicles ready to go and wanted to operate uh, a ride service and charge money and pick up regular passengers? Can you do that today in California? Yeah, so Holly, um, and Zen as well, I think you touched on <coughs> what the DMV does versus CBC, but just to make sure it's clear, you know, the DMV gives you a permit to operate autonomous vehicles in the state. Right now we have a testing driver permit. But if you want to put passengers in the vehicle, you need an additional permit in addition to your DMV permit. You need a permit from the CPC as well. So CPC, it regulates utilities, it regulates Lyft and Uber, it regulates us. The CPC hasn't created permanent regulations for AVs yet. What they have created is a pilot program. And not to make things more <laughs> complex, <laughs> but the pilot program, it's restricted to testing. So what this means is, you can get a testing driver permit from the CPUC, or you can get a testing driverless permit from the CPUC. The reason this is important is in California, if you are testing, you cannot charge for a ride. You can only do that if you have a deployment permit. So basically, this has been the huge debate <laughs> at the CPUC. Um, it came up in the workshop this week because most members of the industry, and, and basically there was a general consensus that like it doesn't make sense to have a service that you can't charge a fare for because there's no real route to commercialization. Um, what I mean is we could, we could um, enter the pilot program, we could put passengers in the cars, but we wouldn't be able to charge for it. And that's like the big rub right now in terms of the limitations of the CPC regulations, why we would like them to expand the pilot program or create permanent deployment rules. Another thing to keep in mind is that unlike the um, transportation network companies, there are some unique restrictions placed on AVs and passengers right now. So if you have a driverless vehicle, you can't have shared rides um, in California. I think that that is related to a concern about strangers in a vehicle without um, a driver supervising, and so that's something that we also have to we also have to challenge that notion because a lot of the environmental benefits, et cetera, will come from shared rides. So, definitely unique um, rules and regulations 
um, in California, but the biggest issue is we're still in this pilot phase and we don't have permanent regulations around passenger service yet. Well, that's a whole handful. Um, <laughs> you're busy. I can see why you guys have such a big team. It's uh, really a lot of complicated rules. Um, so let's let's turn to the question of, of safety and, and testing, which uh, all of you have touched on a little bit. Uh, obviously, everyone wants to know how are we going to determine uh, you know, what is safe enough and when is a particular autonomous vehicle safe enough to deploy on public roads. Um, you know, we obviously, as human drivers, get tested at age 16 and we get our driver's license um, and we take a written test and we take a driving test on the road. Uh, it's much more difficult to test automated driving systems. Um, Xantha, I know AAA, you mentioned, recently bought Fomentum Station to test autonomous vehicles. This is an area uh, of interest that you guys have. Why don't you tell us how you think uh, it should work, uh, how you view testing, whether it should be done by companies or third party, uh, should it be mandatory, voluntary, is this a, a good housekeeping seal of approval or, or some sort of uh, you know, uh, government rule? Yeah, I think um, that's still uh, a huge, a huge issue, a huge area. Um, but really, what we think is that there's there's the best practices that can really be put into place now that don't have to wait for regulation, they don't have to wait for for legislation or, or for mandates. But really, uh, one of the best practices that that is being employed by the industry is to really develop a comprehensive test strategy. Um, with testing in, in three modes, in simulation, on test tracks, and on, on public roads. And that system is really designed to help increase your confidence with uh, the performance of the vehicle as you go from, from one system to another, and it's also iterative. So um, you're learning from what works in simulation and if it also works on road, on, uh, on a closed track and on, on public roads. Um, but you know it's really a complementary system, and you can't just do one of it, one of those modes, and not not do the other ones. Um, because what we've seen at Gomentum is that you know there's been some scenarios, like the performance-based uh, or scenarios that that we talked about earlier, that have been done in simulation and they've worked great. But then you take it out to Gomentum, and things don't quite go the same way. Um, so I know what all the developers are trying to do is is make sure that there's more consistency at in the performance between those, those modes. Um, and what we really want to see, I think, from, um, from, from industry is uh, improvement uh, in that and in, in development of, of um, more accepted standards around testing, how testing is done, um, and also development of a safety framework. So um, safety is, is something that's, that's relative, and you can't guarantee absolute safety. But what you need is, is provable safety with acceptable risk, and that has to be defined you know, by the industry, by, by developers, um, and also helped along um, with regulators. Um, and that's really where uh, AV develop developers make their safety case, and that can be verified and validated by independent third parties. So that's what we like to to see develop, and that's what we do see as, as taking place through standards or through um, programs, uh, frameworks like UL 4600, which is a, um, a process where uh, a, a safety framework and a development of a comprehensive safety case is being developed. Holly, Ike recently published its voluntary safety self-assessment. Uh, can you tell us about the approach that Ike is taking? As you mentioned, you, you have a large vehicle. Uh, how are you approaching safety at Ike? Yeah, I mean, I can I can understand why you know people's initial reaction to an eighty thousand pound truck driving down the highway by itself. Is, you know, some people have a lot of fear, and I can I can certainly understand that. But remember what I said earlier that five thousand people die in trucking accidents per year, and almost all of those are a result of fatigue and driver distraction. And so automation can completely eliminate that risk um, if it's done properly. And so um, we have taken a, a little bit of a different perspective on safety, and that's. Um, for a number of reasons, our co-founders have been working on, you know, on, on, on trucking automation for a number of years right now. Um, and as Michelle said, we did issue our safety report last week, but we didn't issue a typical BSSA. Um, 
we did a number of things. And, and frankly, we've been, you know, our company's been around for a little bit over a year, but our co-founders have been working on this for a number of years, as I said earlier. We've been pretty heads down. We have not been in the press very much, and we've done that on purpose. Um, because we were very, very focused on, on our product and our building our company culture and hiring our team. And so we've only been in the press affirmatively when we announced the company, um, when we announced our Series A back in February and again two weeks ago when we did the safety announcement. And so, you know, we, we've been interviewed here and there for like um, when the press reaches out to us, but these are the three times that we've actually been out in the press. And, and this time um, we chose safety as sort of our first real substantive announcement because we feel like it is such a critical thing for this business and we feel like there needs to be some improvements to the way that the industry thinks about safety and how they validate that. And so what we did with our announcement is we issued three different things, a blog post, that was sort of a shortened medium piece around what our approach to safety is. Um, we also relaunched our website and added a safety page. There's significant transparency on there. You can see what all our truck numbers are. You can see what we're operating, not in real time, but right now where our trucks are operating. Um, and there's a fair amount of information on there that is very difficult to find on the FMCSA page. It's like a needle in a haystack. So we wanted to have all of that in one place. And then the final thing that we did is we issued a very lengthy um, safety report. It's 93 pages. It was written by our systems engineering team. And it is um, what we view as significant transparency, what our approach to building our product is, and how we think about safety. You know, I don't believe that any other company has issued this much information about their approach to building their project, product and safety. And so we're, we're really excited about that. And the other piece, you know, going back to what Xantha was saying about simulation, test tracking, test tracks, and public roads, is we are the first company to issue the safety report before we test on public roads. We're the only company that has done that, I believe. And so we're pretty excited about that. We are not testing on public roads right now. If you see a bike trucks driving around the Bay Area, and you may see them, I was in our truck on Tuesday, um, uh, working with our engineers, and um, right now they are only in manual mode. So they are collecting data, um, and what we are doing to develop our project is product is collecting that data in manual mode, and then we are developing the product in simulation and, and, and on test tracks. And so we're taking those scenes from um, the data collection, we're entering them into the simulation, and then we're doing a lot of test track analysis. That doesn't mean that our product isn't ready to, you know, couldn't be on public roads. It could be, we just don't feel like it is ready to do that, and we won't go on public roads until we've done significant work in simulation and on test tracks, likely sometime next year, but it is, um, we feel like we can make a lot of progress through simulation and test tracks before we have to put our truck on the roads. Great. So Candace, while trucking happens mostly on the freeway, uh, Cruz is thinking about a ride service that drives in the most complicated urban environments with lots of vulnerable <laughs> road users and uh, erratic behavior, especially in San Francisco. Um, how does Cruz think about safety and testing um, as you lead up eventually to uh, deployment? Safety is clearly very critical, um, and it's a gating metric for us before we seek our deployment permit. Um, in order to address safety, we basically, we, you know, Xantha referenced kind of this uh, approach of closed course testing, simulation, as well as on-road testing. Um, I think for us, the fact that we are testing in San Francisco, which is one of the most um, complicated urban environments, the, there's incredible fleet learning every single day here. Um, and I, the best way I could explain it is, you know, if I'm driving and I have an accident, I may have learned something, but no one else in this room will necessarily have any learning from that, right? Whereas with our vehicles, you know, one of them encounters a new scenario that can be used in order to teach the fleet. And so we've been doing that um, for years and you know, we also published um, the voluntary safety report at the federal level, which kind of details our approach to safety more holistically. So we go into things like our operational design domain, our approach to system safety, um, you know, how do we respond to law enforcement. There's so many different components of safety that you have to take into account. And we have ongoing conversations with our regulators, both at the federal level and the state level. So, there, you know, in this industry, you really do have to focus on safety, what your safety case is, and that's something that we are constantly um, focused on. 
At this point, I'd like to open it up to um, any questions from the audience. Uh, anyone have any burning questions? Yes. Um, do you feel that we in the U.S. are at a significant disadvantage because of all the fractured regulations compared to China or you know certain European markets for um, advancement, commercialization, deployment, testing? Um, just because of everything we just mentioned this evening, states, cities, different agencies, politics, and so on. Um, you know, I haven't studied every country, <laughs> but at a high at a high level, I would say that you know we are ahead with respect to some like many countries look to the United States. Um, to get guidance, you know, and they, if we get, for example, the exemption from NHTSA, that will lead to progress in other countries. I actually think that, you know, in the European countries, sometimes it's actually more complex. I would say China, though, is a good example of a place where, you know, they're building, um, like, I don't know if you call it a whole city, but they're building environments specifically for autonomous vehicles. So. They do have certain advantages in that sense, things that will potentially like speed the technology. Um, so, and there are other countries where the regulations haven't been written yet that might be open to more consultation with industry and where there are less layers of bureaucracy. So I agree with you, there are certain unique challenges of the United States, but we're also a leader. Um, and you see so many companies um, opening their doors here for a reason. So that's not a yes or no answer, <laughs> but that would be my response. Yes, I, I mean, I, I guess it's good to point out the difference between operations and technology because there's, you know, this is such a hub for technology and innovation. So. Okay, other questions? Hi, I'm Josephine. So there's been a lot of talk about policy um, for getting AVs to in operation, but what does the policy look like? Uh, governing human interactions with the AV? Well, I think that's an interesting question. I suspect it has more to do with cars because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're building a level four truck and we won't have um, humans in our trucks and we will only be driving on the freeways. Um, we will not be driving on local roads. Um, so, and we've chosen that for a reason because we think it's much easier to de develop automation technology that doesn't have to interact with pedestrians and bicycles and things like that. Right. Um, I so oh, oh, but to, to that point, but uh, let's say you have your truck and you have the trailer, unloading the trailer, reloading the trailer, getting the truck back on the road, that would involve human interaction. But then, just not only that, but human interaction is, you have all these expensive sensors on your car, how do you ensure that they're kept safe? From It could be for trucks, but it could also be for uh, cars. Yeah, no, so I think those are, are both good questions and very different questions. I think from the sensor perspective, you know, we're still developing the technology, but I think we will have the ability to check those sensors electronically, like every time the truck pulls into the transfer seat, transfer hub, and have the ability to know if something's happening all, all along the route, which is even more than what happens right now with a manually driven truck. Um, on the human interaction piece, I think that's, you know, something we didn't actually get to, which is sort of workforce impacts and partial automation and things like that. Um, and you know, I could have a whole hour conversation on that, but I won't do that right now. So um, I do think that there's you know, probably the, the first question I get from almost anyone I talk to about my job is, wow, aren't you cutting millions of people out of work? Um, and, and that's not even remotely true. Um, there were articles a few years ago saying you're gonna put three and a half million truck drivers out of work. Well, there actually aren't anywhere near three and a half million over the road long haul truck drivers. There's maybe a few hundred thousand. There's actually been studies done on that recently. Um, and so I think those, that information is changing. And we're also doing a long haul trucking automation piece. So the truck will drive itself on the highway and then it will pull into a transfer hub and that's where your human interaction will happen. There will be people there to fuel the truck, to maintain the truck, to inspect the truck. And then people will actually get in a tractor, attract, attach that trailer and drive a short haul. And our view is those will actually be more jobs and better jobs over time because trucking automation will decrease costs, increase utilization, Right now, a truck driver can only drive 11 hours a day out of 24 hours. And so if you switch that to um, an automated truck, 
24 hours is maybe you know over the top, but let's say it's 20 hours, which is significantly more than 11. You're increasing that utilization, you're driving the cost down, you're allowing more freight, you know, right now it's 70% of freight moving in trucks in this country. If we can imagine it being more than that. And so you imagine you have more freight being moved in trucks, that means more short haul trips and more jobs for people who drive local, lo those local jobs. That means people can be at home in their beds with their families at night. That means that they're not away from their homes for three weeks at a time, that they're not eating at truck stops, they're not, you know, not able to exercise. Um, so we really think that if there will be more jobs, more short haul jobs, and also um, better quality jobs. Okay. And we have further oh, questions? I think yeah. I have a slide. Oh, sorry. The only thing I was going to add is that, you know, in the case of autonomous vehicles used in a ride share, mm -hmm. sharing service, you know, we also, you know, are evaluating what our human machine interface is going to look like inside the vehicle. So, for example, you know, we will have an option if someone needs to pull over so they have the ability to do that. And we have like an OnStar um, service within the vehicle so you can contact an, an operator if there's an emergency in the vehicle. So we do take into account, you know, how do you, you know, in the absence of a driver, how do you account for emergencies? How do you communicate to the passengers such that they have trust and confidence in the experience so to the extent you're wondering like you know how do you interact <coughs> with the passenger those are things that are definitely being discussed by the industry and we're trying to address um, those factors in this way yeah just to add on to that i think one of the things that AAA northern california is working on is actually uh education of our the public and our members about how to interact with uh uh, AVs, and one of the things that we worked on with Waymo was uh, their Let's Talk Self-Driving campaign, and specifically the school safety campaign, uh, where we worked uh, to develop a curriculum that uh, we deliver to um, to schools and uh, integrated. Um, it's really for the kids who do school safety patrols. So, like when they go to school and um, they 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 get elected as these school school safety patrol. Uh, patrollers and it's super cute, um, but they they help um, you know they're um, they help the cars at the school and the kid the kids who get out of the cars at the school uh, get there safely and, and get to school safely. But we in integrated uh, dealing with ABs into the curriculum for that school safety patrol program um, and really getting people to to understand that like you have to still interact with the AV even if it doesn't have a driver. You have to anticipate what. It may or may not do. So that was one of the first steps that we took to really educate um, the next generation who are going to be growing up with uh, autonomous <coughs> vehicles. Candace, you mentioned that you're gating deployment on certain safety metrics. What sort of metrics are you guys using for that? Yeah, so I I can't delve into our internal validation process, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I I will say though that ultimately we will not launch unless we are safer than the status quo for road safety. But unfortunately, I can't speak to that only because it is proprietary right now. Other questions? All right, I guess we'll leave it there. Thanks so much to all of you. That was fun. <laughs>
and uh, we'll provide more information if you are part of our mailing list or if you're not, just sign up. It's on womenatonomy.com. And uh, we would love to hear more from you guys. What are the topics that you would like to have discussions on? If you want to have certain panelists in our discussions, do email us and we'll be happy to have them in the upcoming ones. And I also want to make an announcement about a Women in Automotive uh, Technology event, which is Destination Safety, Technical and Regulatory Challenges and Opportunities for EVs. It's kind of similar. Um, at Samsung headquarters in San Jose in Octo October 28th. And uh, Lisa Franklin, yeah, uh, she is going to, uh, basically she, she'll be here to assist you if you want to know more about this uh, event and want to know uh, how to get registered for this. And thank you everyone. Could, could I add to that? But I'm working with uh, Lisa and Women in Automotive Technology and we're organizing an event. It hasn't been announced yet, probably on Monday. It's about human and AV interaction. It'll be on November 20th in Mountain View. Oh, that answers the question right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for attending this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.